This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Hey, aloha and welcome to Stanley Energy Man on Think Tech Hawaii, where community matters. And I'm really, really excited for our last show of 2017. 2017 has been a, a jam-packed year. You've heard me mention this a couple times. I have no idea where this year went, but it's in our rearview mirror uh, as of this weekend. And we're closing out this year with one of the, the greatest guests I think I could ever expect to have on the show, Mr. Andy Marsh, who's the president and CEO of Plug Power. And for those who uh, deal with hydrogen, they know that Plug Power is a uh, uh, definitely a uh, force to be reckoned with in the fuel cell industry and the hydrogen industry. And we're really, really glad that we could have Mr. Marsh on this morning to, to discuss uh, the state of the art of hydrogen in the U.S. and around the world. So, Andy, I, I really, really thank you for being on today. And I'm looking forward to uh, having a good discussion with you. Well, aloha, Stan, and uh, happy new year. And really looking forward to our discussion today. Great. Hey, could you start off by telling us, the audience a little bit about how you got into doing what you're doing and how you moved into Plug Power and, and then get us up to date on what Plug Power has been up to? Sure, Stan. I've actually been in energy and new technologies my entire career. I started off uh, over 35 years ago with Bell Laboratories, and I was working there on powering wireless equipment in the 1980s and broadband equipment in the 90s. And after 18 years of the labs, I actually started my own company with a few friends, uh, which we grew into a $100 million business, uh, building power systems for broadband applications uh, in the United States and across the world. And the company was sold in 2007, and I was on vacation in the Virgin Islands in 2008, and my phone rang, and it was Plug Power, and they asked me if I would be interested in sitting down and talking to them about uh, the CEO position. And after my successful run as CEO at the company I started called Valier, and you know I've actually been involved in fuel, knowledgeable about fuel cells for many years since my father worked for General Electric and worked for fuel cells in the 60s, I, I understood the possibilities and the challenges in the industry, and you know, I was nicely offered the job, and I was lucky to, uh, lucky to be the CEO of Plug Power for almost 10 years now. So, so when you started at Plug Power, about how many uh, employees did they have? Well, you know, it, it's interesting. When I joined Plug, we had about $1 million dollars in product revenue. And we actually had about 350 employees. Okay. And you know, my, uh, you know, one of the more difficult challenges was that I had to resize the business really to meet the revenue. And you know, we, 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 got, we became as small as 60 people, uh, but today we have over 600 folks and are continuing to grow. And uh, you know, we, Many of the people we let go in the early years actually have been back and you know, are significant contributors to the growth of our company today. Well, and, and that's important. That's why I asked the question about number of employees because, you know, when you, a lot of times you come into a company and, and the first thing you got to do is apply some tough leadership love and, uh, and get the company stable so you can grow it. And, uh, and uh, I knew that was part of uh, what you did at Plug Power to make it uh, what it is today. So. How big are you now? And, and give us an idea of the kind of things that you're doing, because it's just exciting. I mean, I, I know what you're doing, but I think everybody else in the world needs to know what you're doing, because it's really cool. Sure. So, so you were talking about the stand making hard decisions. And about nine years ago, when we looked at the market, uh, we were trying to find a sector in which we could see that we could offer customers value. And we had some experiments going on putting fuel cells into forklift trucks. So, you know, the trucks that we could see that uh, by using fuel cells in forklift trucks, we could eliminate a battery change-out process that could take up to 20, 25 minutes at many, at many companies. These are manufacturing companies or retailers who distribute products. Uh, we saw we could improve the performance of a truck where uh, the truck ran 
10 to 12 percent uh, uh, more, it was 12 to 10 to 12 percent more productive because of the characteristics of fuel cells. We also help folks eliminate the battery change out room, and folks are pretty excited about eliminating lead acid batteries. So we looked at that, and we also saw that it was a large market opportunity. So there's over 6 million forklift trucks in the world. And so, you know, you started thinking and said, hey, I can, uh, I can start building a viable business, uh, charge a little bit more because there's value being added, okay. and drive down the cost of our products. So today we have over 20,000 fuel cells in the field powering forklift trucks at facilities like Amazon and Walmart and BMW. And we also found along the way, Stan, that we just couldn't just provide fuel cells, that we also had to build the hydrogen fueling stations. And the company has built over 60 hydrogen fueling systems at distribution centers and manufacturing facilities. We've done well over 10 million hydrogen fueling, fuelings, and on a daily basis, we actually use about 15 tons of hydrogen in our products. We're the largest user of industrial hydrogen for fuel in the world. Yeah, I, I have to admit, going on your website, it's like you've got the cradle to grave. In fact, we, we oftentimes give Toyota the credit uh, of wanting to bring the chicken and the egg like they're doing here in Surfco in Hawaii, but you brought the chicken, the egg, the chicken feed, <laughs> and and uh, everything. You got this maintenance package. You've got the the uh, vehicles themselves or the forklifts themselves in different sizes and and uh, to fit the market. Um, but one of the things that I look forward to with your association, particularly with Walmart um, and some of the big box companies I know that run 24 seven, that's now starting to build up that infrastructure across the continental US where um, between you and maybe Tesla One or Tesla Trucking, uh, you're gonna really start that infrastructure across the continental US for hydrogen transportation. Uh, are you seeing that as part of your plan too? You know, Stan, when, when we look at uh, what we've done with hydrogen uh, is really just a start. And that, um, you know, for example, as well as with fuel cells, and let me take a step back. I mean, in 2017, we deployed our first fuel cells into delivery vans. So we have FedEx trucks which are running on plug power fuel cells today. We have delivery vans in China, which are operating on plug power fuel cells today. And you mentioned our maintenance package. I should mention that uh, for each of the units in the field, our units are connected via the Internet of Things. So we actually know in real time the performance of our units and how they're operating for our, our customers. Uh, that being said, when we start looking at hydrogen, we see a large opportunity not only for hydrogen on the distribution side, but hydrogen when it comes to generation. So we're in discussions with many of the large industrial gas companies about how Plug Power can partner with them not only to uh, provide fueling infrastructure, but also long-term uh, to, uh, to, to move into the hydrogen generation business. Since we represent such a steady, consistent load for the large industrial gas companies, we're a very attractive partner for the long run. And did I read right on your website that, um, that you can use industrial grade hydrogen in your fuel cells on those forklifts? So what's the purity standard that you folks have set um, that you have to maintain to keep your forklifts running? Well, we do, you know, the fuel cells require 99.9 percent. .9%. Okay. And, um, you know, that's, uh, you know, there are processes, you know, about 65 percent of the hydrogen we use actually is hydrogen that would have just been burned off in the air. And that hydrogen comes from often chloralkali plants uh, where the hydrogen uh, is would just be waste uh, coming out of the process of making plastic, and the hydrogen is cleaned up through a, uh, a purifier and then used in our products. I see. Okay. So you're actually tapping into, again, a different source of hydrogen 
that's available where you're at. We we don't have that luxury here in Hawaii, but uh, yeah, that's that's no, good. No, it's, it's it's actually a very, you know, when you really think about it, it's a quite a renewable solution uh, because it allows you know hydrogen that would be wasted uh, and be reused. You know, in Hawaii, obviously, you know, with the all your uh, Nice sunshine every day, which which I wish we were having uh, here in upstate New York. That uh, you know, certainly solar with electrolysis is, I think, a long-term solution for hydrogen on the Hawaiian islands. Well, we'd love to have you come out here sometime and give us some good advice on uh, the directions we can take. Uh, are you are you actually in any discussions with the other big box companies like uh, maybe Lowe's and Home Depot and? Uh, maybe big um, uh, re companies like Safeway or you know nationwide chains, uh, Macy's, any of those that that also fit your model for using your material handling. Sure, we um, we actually have sites with Home Depot and Lowe's today, and uh, you know, both of them are really targeted for much broader rollouts than we presently have with them. Okay, so we have. Uh, Home Depot's largest internet uh, site, uh, retail site, is actually in Troy, Ohio, and uh, there's about 200 plug power fuel cells uh, providing power to the forklift trucks there, as well as the pl plug power hydrogen station. We have a number of sites with Lowe's also, and uh, we'd love to make Safeway a customer. Yeah, because they're they're out here too, and uh, you know, quite. Remarkably um, and coincidentally, when we started our hydrogen implementation working group out here two years ago, um, right near the top of our list of uh, possible uh, revenue sources was um, lift trucks and forklifts um, to move material out here, uh, along with fleet vehicles, uh, because we thought that the commercial um, passenger car market was going to take a while to develop. So we were looking hard at, um, at um, forklifts and pallet electric pallet jacks and pallet movers uh, here in Hawaii to help us develop our infrastructure. And I know you come out here on vacation. Do you think that's a viable uh, model out here in Hawaii? Because uh, we don't do as much 24-7 as the big Walmart and, uh, and um, Amazon uh, warehouses do, where that's where your value proposition really takes off when you're, when you're working 24-7 and those forklifts, if they're not moving, they're not making money. Um, you know, do you think that we can still take advantage of uh, hydrogen in the material handling world out here in Hawaii? And I think, Stan, you, I, the answer question I think is yes. And uh, I think there's a number of reasons uh, when you think about Hawaii's goal to be, you know, renewable by 2045, when you think about using solar electrolysis as a source of hydrogen, uh, when you think about coupling not only forklifts, but uh, coupling items like delivery vans and even on-road on vehicles using hydrogen so that you can spread out the cost of infrastructure across a multitude of devices. I think there is a, a strong value proposition. We know in general with fleet vehicles that when one starts thinking about the cost of electrical infrastructure, when one moves past about 30 units, uh, fuel cells make a great deal more sense than lithium batteries today. And maybe on the second half of the discussion here, we can talk about some of the uh, activities that are going on globally. Okay, that will be great. In fact, that's a good uh, spot for us to take a quick break here. And we'll, uh, we'll be back in 60 seconds to spend more time with Andy Marsh and talk about plug power and fuel cells uh, across the globe. Hi guys, it's RV Kelly. I'm your host of Out of the Comfort Zone, where I find cool people with cool solutions to problems that all of us face. Now, the thing is, we're really cool, and I only invite really cool people, but the thing is, I think you're kind of cool too, so I think you should come and watch. That Thursdays at 11 a.m. here on OC16 Television with Think Tech Hawaii. I'm RV Kelly, host of Out of the Comfort Zone, and I will see you next Thursday. I just walked by and I said, what's happening, guys? They told me they were making music. They said I could play. 
so any chance you play at all, you know, that's my life. I love music. Hey, and welcome back to Stan Energy Man on my lunch hour. Stan Osterman here with Andy Marsh, the president and CEO of Plug Power. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with Plug Power, it's uh, a big, big company now in, in the world that makes uh, probably the most fuel cells, especially uh, the smaller scale fuel cells. Uh, and I say that relative to 150 kilowatt, but uh, forklift and truck size fuel cells, um, probably the biggest in the world, if not at least the biggest in the U.S. for sure. And uh, we're excited to have them on and talking about the future of hydrogen um, fuel cells and hydrogen technology across the globe because he's uh, plugged into the newly minted Hydrogen uh, Council, which is an international uh, consortium of investors and manufacturers that have anything to do with hydrogen. Uh, some of the names in this consortium include uh, Shell Oil and Total Oil, um, Air Liquide, um, Air Gas, uh, plug Power, Proton on site, there's Kawasaki, Honda, Toyota, they're all in this group and, and they're all taken off and they've decided that uh, it's time to, to let hydrogen see its day and make it into the sunshine and, and get on everybody's uh, on everybody's radar. So welcome back, Andy, and uh, you know, let's let's head down that, that road. I'm, you were in uh, Bonn for the last COP, COP23 with um, the members of the Hydrogen Council and um, all the uh, events going on in Bonn that week. Could you give us some insight as to uh, some of the discussions over there? You know, I think the uh, big event when it comes to hydrogen was that uh, McKin the Hydrogen Council asked McKinsey back in January, uh, where the council was formed at Davos, uh, to do a study on the industry to understand how it will grow in the coming years. And when they looked at uh, the hydrogen industry and the value that fuel cells and hydrogen could provide society, you know, they came to the conclusion that the industry will be a $2.5 trillion industry by 2050 that will be high, will have about 250 million people working in this industry. 250 million people working in this industry that, uh, yeah, I'm confusing my numbers here, Stan, it'll be 250 it. billion, <laughs> it'll be about uh, 250,000 people working in this industry. Okay. Uh, you know, they see that the investment in the industry between now and 2030 of over $250 billion. I think what's really interesting is that they see 18% of the energy in the world coming from hydrogen by 2050 and really being significant even by 2030. And hydrogen will be used as an energy source not only in the transportation sector, but also in power generation in industrial uses for uh, uh, refining steel. So, you know, it's not just fuel cells. And, uh, you know, the reason these companies, and certainly they all are concerned about the environment, but they see a huge, massive market opportunity because of the advantages hydrogen has versus batteries in many cases. So when you think about the transportation sector, for example, batteries have some unique advantages. If you think about lithium batteries, oh, their efficiency is 80%. Uh, but they do have one big challenge, and that's charging infrastructure. And uh, as I mentioned in the first part of our segment, that uh, when you think about uh, over 30 vehicles, uh, electrical infrastructure starts becoming more complicated and more costly than fuel cells. Transportation with fuel cells, you have the experience of fast fueling that you have with autos today. But I think most important, why it's important both for power generation and transportation. The density of hydrogen at pressures is about 10 to 15 times more than batteries. So when you think about transportation from cars to drones, the lightweight of fuel cells versus batteries, there is a real distinct advantage. And that's why McKinsey decided that this segment was going to grow rapidly. And I think you're beginning to see seeds of that around the world. Now, there's 3,000 cars on the road in California today by Toyota. 
There's, you know, the Olympics in 20, 2018 coming up. Uh, fuel cells will be highlighted both in the 2018 Olympics in Seoul, but also in Japan in the 2020 Olympics. So there is a real global push for fuel cells that the Hydrogen Council and members are, uh, uh, are, are significantly behind. But it's really fundamentally, it adds value to consumers and will help make for a greener, cleaner world than we have today. Yeah, I got to admit, when, when I was in New York and listening to all the presentations that you and the other uh, corporate leaders, and, and that was actually an eye-opener by itself, the folks that were at the Hydrogen Council meeting and pitching to the investors were not vice presidents or you know someone that works in the company. These were all the CEOs of some really large companies that, that work the hydrogen industry. And to hear them talk about not just their products or what they make, but the diversity and the, the common sense approach to how hydrogen will, will solve a lot of problems, not just the uh, carbon emission problems, but can be uh, leveraged into new tech, new, um, new energy sources, new uh, materials, new uh, processes for making uh, you know, materials like steel, as you mentioned. Um, and it's kind of like the Swiss Army knife um, of energy. You can store the energy, you can use it to cook with it. Um, it's available all over, unlike lithium, which has a fairly limited um, you know, resource on our planet. Uh, and we, it's like we're going right from one fossil fuel with uh, limited resources around the world to, you know, lithium was, is another limited resource that now we're going to have to look at as a strategic reserve. And especially when you try and scale up the transportation sector, um, it can't be the answer to everybody's questions. But batteries are always going to be a part of our, our fuel cell vehicles and, your, and forklifts and things. But it was just refreshing to hear the industry across the board talk about the diversity of the hydrogen um, economy and the ways that it's going to contribute in the future, um, the stability it will bring to, uh, you're not fighting over oil, you don't have to fight over hydrogen, everybody's got it. It's in their backyard, it's in their uh, landfills, it's in uh, everything they have around them. Um, it was just great to be part of those discussions and listen to folks talk about it. I, I agree, Stan, and, and, I, you know, and we were talking about fuel cells and the environment, but there is a fundamental value of electric vehicles, uh, which can either be powered by fuel cells or lithium batteries. When you think about the electrification of the world, you know, it, you know, electric vehicles, whether it's, you know, 30 years from now, electric airplanes or electric cars, uh, electric vehicles are fundamentally more reliable, more dependable than internal combustion engines. It actually opens up whole new markets for people beyond the big auto companies today. And I think, you know, when you think about mega trends that are going on in the world, from the creation of mega cities to a sharing economy for automobiles, uh, cars will be on the road 18 hours a day. Uh, be it Hawaii or be it New York City or be it Honolulu or be it New York City, when you think about Lyft or Uber providing people services and fuel cells and their fast fueling and uh, utilizing the assets like we do in forklift trucks, really have become very, very valuable for society in general beyond a clean environment. Exactly. There's, there's companies out there now that are looking at merging the Uber and Lyft concept with the fact that you have autonomous vehicles and instead of a car sitting around in your carport or your garage for you know most of its lifetime, these vehicles are going to be on the road you know 24 hours a day with no driver inside and you're going to be maximizing the use of those vehicles and you can make an electric vehicle that maintenance goes down, um, make it a hydrogen electric vehicle and your weight goes down so less wear and tear on the roads and the tires. And um, you just start to see all the benefits of it. And uh, I think hydrogen is one of those things where when you open that Christmas present, it's going to just start really showing you um, what you can do. When you open that package, it's going to say, hey, we can provide medical oxygen for the hospitals. We can provide, you know, this industry, this product, and, you know, the fertilizer industry, this product, and we can work with these guys and do this cheaper. It's, it's just going to be a, a huge gift once people recognize the value of hydrogen. You know, Stan, I, I agree 100%, and boy, I wish I was 
30 years old instead of 60 years old because I would love to do this another 40, 40 years because uh, I really think this is uh, like when I was a kid and working in wireless, this is going to take over the world one day. And uh, it is a really exciting time. And when you mentioned about uh, autonomous vehicles, fuel cells beat batteries hands down because we can refuel in minutes versus how long does it take to charge a battery. You can get more out of your asset using a fuel cell than you could never get out of battery. Not that there isn't a place for batteries, but there's a big place in the world for fuel cell uh, vehicles. Yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, Hawaii was one of the places that pioneered electric vehicles uh, almost 20 years ago. In fact, the company or the agency I work with started off working with Hyundai and uh, our county uh, transportation sector and the military under DARPA, of all things, to do electric vehicles. And we have had um, a lot of folks out, out here working on it. And, you know, when you think about it, with that big of a head start, um, we've also found out what some of the limitations are. And in, in our uh, society here, we have a lot of structures that are more than 25 or 30 years old, and their electric system is not sufficient in like a high-rise apartment building that was built 30 years ago to, to provide the power needed for a bunch of electric plug installs unless they upgrade the utility to the building. And sometimes that's several hundred thousand dollars for transformers to put in the chargers that you need. So we're, we're, we're certain that the, the battery plug-in vehicles are going to play a role in Honolulu, but it's, it's tough to deal with the infrastructure -ish challenges with plug-ins as well. And so hydrogen uh, will give us some more electric vehicles on the road and give us uh, a little bit more diversity in how we, how we power those things, how we store the energy. And, and, you know, Stan, before we go here, the reasons you mentioned for Honolulu were for high rises is exactly the reason China is making such a big push in the fuel cells. The so fuel cells are part of the Chinese five-year plan. You know, the high rises in Shanghai much newer, can't handle the electrical infrastructure. And China expects to have over 50,000 fuel cell vehicles on the road by 2025 and over a million by 2030. Uh, around the world, people expect to have over 4,000 hydrogen stations, which can support, like a gas station, you know, six to 700 cars per day. So there is a real bright future for fuel cells and also a real bright future for plug power. I'm seeing that too, so um, I can't get ahead of the, the uh, insider trading laws, I guess, because I, I, <laughs> I, I wish I could. But um, Me it, too, Stan. <laughs> <laughs> it's like now, now I'm old enough and I have the money, but I don't have the years in front of me to, to do a whole lot of stuff that I'd like to do, just like you. But hey, Andy, yep. I'm so happy you could join us today on the show, and um, obviously I'm going to have to have you come back a, at least a couple more times to update us on what's going on with the uh, Hydrogen Council and, uh, and what's going on with Plug Power. But thanks so much for being with us today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Stan. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to all my friends in Hawaii. All right. Well, haole uh, makahiki ho, as they say in Hawaii. Happy New Year. <laughs> and uh, we look forward to talking to you in 2018. So, uh, so thanks thank very much, you, Andy. Thank you, Stan. Okay. And uh, that's going to do it for Stan Energy Man for 2017, and we're going to sign off here and see you next year. And uh, really, it's going to be an exciting year in 2018. So thanks to Robert and Cindy here in the studio for helping to put everything together, and thanks again to Andy Marsh for being on our show. Aloha.